client requests that you help them break their phone addiction. You set up a measurement system where you will record their behavior for every 15 minutes, every three hours. During that 15 minutes, you will record in intervals of one minute. If they look at their phone at all during the one minute, it counts as a response. If they look seven or more times, they do not receive reinforcement. What type of data collection are you most likely using? Okay, kind of a long question, a lot of information. Remember, if there's a, a long question where there's a lot of numbers and a lot of information going on, the first place you want to start is understanding what is the question asking, okay? We want to know what are you trying to figure out? And this question, we're just trying to figure out what type of data collection are we using, okay? So we're not worried about averages or totals or anything like that. We just want to know what data collection are we using? So if we're setting up a measurement system where where we are recording the behavior for 15 minutes every three hours, okay? We're using some sort of discontinuous measurement, obviously, right? If our session is three hours, we're only taking data for 15 minutes out of the three hours, that's gonna be discontinuous measurement. What are our discontinuous measurement? We have whole interval, we have partial interval, and we have momentary time sampling. So we're, we know it's gonna be one of those three, okay? Our Data collection says that if they look at their phone at all during the interval, during the one minute interval, it counts as a response. So knowing we're using discontinuous measurement and knowing we're using intervals, okay, what type of interval measurement do we record a response if the behavior occurs at all during the interval? Is it momentary time sampling, partial interval, or whole interval? Well, we know momentary time sampling is at the very end of the interval, which is not what we're looking at. We know whole interval, the behavior has to occur during the entire interval. Partial interval is the one we're looking for because during partial interval, if the behavior occurs at all during the interval, we count it as a response. And in this case, if they look at their phone at all during the one minute interval, it counts as a response. So you are using partial interval data collection, okay? That's how we should be thinking about these questions. Once you get better at the test, okay, you're gonna be able to move a lot quicker through the questions, all right? When you're first starting out though, take your time, okay? And understand each aspect of the answer, okay? Your speed will increase as you do more and as you get better. The first thing your BCBA asks you to do is take notes on the client's room. This is where the client and you will work during session. You are to observe the environment to develop a better understanding of the setting. What type of assessment are you most likely conducting? Okay, a couple key words here, right? It's obviously some sort of observation, some sort of assessment, right? You are observing the environment, all right? You're not actually observing the client, okay, or the, or the client's parents, right? We're observing the environment, okay? We're trying to develop a better understanding of the setting, and that's the key word, okay? If we are evaluating the setting, what are we doing? What type of assessment are we conducting? Is this a direct assessment? Well, no. A direct assessment is when you directly observe the client, right? We're not directly observing the client. You're just looking at the environment in the setting. So if we're looking at this environment in the setting, we are performing a what? We are performing an ecological assessment, okay? An ecological assessment looks at the setting, the environment that the client normally works in or lives in, okay? and starts to determine how it has an impact on the client, okay? That's what you're doing here. Their room, their setting, what do you notice about that setting and their environment, okay? Obviously, it's not a communication assessment, not directly observing them. We're not seeing how they communicate. And it's not a functional analysis. We're not trying to determine a function of a behavior. You're simply looking at the setting and assessing that environment, which is an ecological assessment. The Kansas City Chiefs try and run a play every 10 seconds. Last game, their statistician informed them they ran a play every 13 seconds. In order to get to 10 seconds, the Chiefs must reduce what aspect of running plays? Okay, so if you want to get really good at it, at ABA and at, at the test, you'll start applying our concepts to everyday life, okay? Remember, behavior analysis applies to real life. We're studying human behavior, 
Okay. So in this case, we're applying it to a football team. Okay. They're running a play every 10 seconds. Well, that's their goal. Okay. Last game, they ran one every 13 seconds. So they, they need to reduce what? Okay. To get to 10 seconds. Do they need to reduce the frequency of their plays? Well, no, they need to increase the frequency of their plays, right? Because we want to get to 10 seconds, right? We're going too slow. What about latency? Okay. Is there an issue between the time from the SD to the start of the play? Not really, right? It doesn't seem like there's any issue starting the game, okay? Starting to run plays, okay? So latency is not right either. Do they need to reduce the function? That doesn't really make sense, right? The function is the reason the behavior is occurring, okay? So we're never trying, we're not really reducing a function, okay? So that leaves us with what? IRT or inter response time. What is inter response time? Inter response time is the time in between two responses. So if we're trying to run a play every 10 seconds, we need our IRT to be 10 seconds. Last game, our IRT was 13 seconds. We have to reduce that to get to 10. Okay, obviously the Chiefs must reduce IRT to get to 10 seconds per game. Okay, start applying ABA concepts to your everyday life and start looking for scenarios where you can apply these terms and definitions that you know. The more you do that, the better you'll get at the test. The test is all applied scenarios, okay? And so if you're used to just thinking about things in, in, in the ABA lens, Okay, the exam is going to become much easier for you. All right. So the Kansas City Chiefs need to reduce the IRT of plays to get to 10 seconds. Performing a behavior in an environment other than the one that the behavior was trained in is considered what? Okay, so some of the questions on the exam aren't going to be overly difficult. Some might be very easy. Your goal by the time you're ready to take your exam is to be able to answer these easy questions and 15, 20 seconds, okay? You know, get through them quickly and get to the harder questions, right? Because a question like this is something you should just know immediately by the time you're taking your exam, okay? So when we're performing a behavior in an environment other than the one that the behavior was trained in, what are we doing? Are we maintaining? Are we generalizing? Are we incidental teaching? Or are we continuous reinforcement? So obviously you should, you should, eliminate continuous reinforcement, okay? It has nothing to do with performing this behavior. Incidental teaching is also naturalistic teaching. We're not teaching anything here, right? We're performing a behavior. So that leaves us with maintenance and generalization, okay? Maintenance is what? Maintenance is performing a behavior once teaching has stopped. Generalization is performing a behavior in an environment other than the one the behavior was trained in. Our ultimate goal is generalization. If we train in a, cl in a clinic, we want that behavior to translate to school and home. If we train at home, we want that behavior to translate to school, right? That's generalizing. When you can perform a behavior outside of the environment where you were trained or outside of stimulus stimuli you were trained on, you're starting to generalize. Easy questions. Be able to do the easy ones quickly, okay, by the time you get to your exam. Tiffany hates when her little brother runs into her room. Every time he does, she yells at him and threatens to tell their mom. Tiffany's brother continues to run into her room despite this. Tiffany's yelling and threatening functions as what in relation to her brother's behavior. All right. So this is a situation okay, where this typical idea of yelling and threatening, okay, we typically think is some sort of punishment. But how do we determine if a consequence is a punisher or a reinforcer? Well, we have to look at how the behavior is impacted. If the behavior increases or maintains, we consider the consequence a reinforcer. If the behavior decreases, we consider the consequence a punisher. Okay, And that's how we look at it. So what is the consequence here? When Tiffany's brother runs into her room, Tiffany yells and threatens him. That's the consequence. What is happening to the brother's behavior? Well, her brother continues to run into her room. So that behavior is maintained or increased. 
Therefore, is it a punisher or a reinforcer? Well, it's a reinforcer, right? Reinforcement increases. And then we have to look at positive or negative. Is Tiffany adding stimulus or taking away stimulus, okay? Well, the yelling and the threatening, we are adding something to the environment, okay? So we are positively reinforcing Tiffany's brother's behavior through the yelling and threatening. This is why we always have to be careful with our consequences. Something we perceive as a reinforcer or perceive as a punisher can actually function the opposite way. We always need to be aware of how our consequences are affecting future behavior. You work with the client in home five days a week. The first two weeks were typical, but now the client's parents get into heated arguments every session. It is now starting to interrupt your session and you feel uncomfortable. What should you do? Okay, so you're in home, you're in somebody else's house, right? Somebody else's environment and things happen, right? Things, things happen, okay? And so in this case, your session's interrupted. You're starting to feel uncomfortable. The arguments may be getting worse, okay? How do you respond? You're the RBT in this situation. How do you respond to this scenario? Okay, remember this is an ethical question, right? Think about the task list. Think about what our task list says. Remember, all these questions are pulled straight from the task list. If you know the task list, okay, you can start to relate things to each other. And there's some specific steps to take based on the task list in these scenarios, okay? So what do you do as the RBT? Do you ignore it? You're there for the client and their treatment plan. You almost never ignore things and ethics questions, okay? There's very, very rarely a situation where you're just gonna ignore something. Okay, because communication is key, right? And we want teamwork and your supervisor is there for a reason, okay? So ignoring a problem or ignoring an issue that you're feeling is rarely, rarely, rarely going to be the answer, okay? So you can't just ignore what's going on here, right? One, it could be affecting the client. Two, it is affecting you, okay? We can't just ignore the environment, okay, in this setting. What about ask the parents to stop arguing? It is disruptive. This is a fine line, okay, where this isn't necessarily your role, okay? You shouldn't be put in this position to ask the parents something like that, okay? This is your supervisor's role. That's why your supervisor is there, okay, to handle these things, right? You're there to implement the treatment plan, okay, which is great. Don't feel like you need to be doing the heavy lifting of asking parents these type of things, okay? So that is not the RBT's role. What about reach out to your supervisor as soon as possible and request guidance? Absolutely, straight from the task list, right? Uh, ask for feedback in a timely manner, seek clinical training in a timely manner, right? Communicate with your supervisor in a timely manner. Communication, 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 so, so important. If you're uncomfortable, if you feel your session is being affected, you should reach out as soon as possible and request further guidance from your supervisor on what to do. Remember, we're worried about the outcome of our clients. If this is affecting the outcome of our client, we need to act. And then finally, offer marriage advice to the couple. Definitely not. That is way out of our scope. RBTs do not parent train on their own. We certainly do not offer marriage or counseling advice. Okay, unless for some reason you're hired as a marriage counselor as well. But we work within our scope of ABA. Okay, offering marriage advice is not what we should be doing. If this is to happen, if you're in this situation, reach out to your supervisor and request guidance. All right, the basic reinforcement schedule. This basic reinforcement schedule is often referred to as having the slot machine effect due to its unpredictable nature. Okay, again, really, really easy uh, question, right? This, this is a very common ABA question, actually. You know, um, anybody who's worked in ABA or studied ABA, okay, at one point heard this, okay? There's one basic reinforcement schedule that we consider the slot machine effect because it's the reinforcement schedule a slot machine's on. If you're in Vegas and you're putting money um, in a slot machine, and I'm from Vegas, right? So if you're putting money in the slot machine, and you're pulling the, the handle, right? You're only re receiving reinforcement, okay? Spont you can't predict when you're receiving it, right? It's an average amount of pulls, right? 
You can go five pools without receiving money, 10 pools without receiving money. Sometimes you might receive money four or five pools in a row, okay? So what is this unpredictable nature that's based on responses, okay? Because remember, we're, each time we pull the slot machine, it's a response. So are we looking at a fixed ratio? Well, a fixed ratio would be the, the number doesn't change. And in a slot machine, reinforcement changes all the time, right? It's not like we're on a fixed ratio of two where every two pools, I'm gonna receive reinforcement. I can go 20 pools without, okay? So that number is changing. Therefore, what do we need to look at? We need to look at the variable ratio, okay? It's based on a certain number of responses and it's on an average, okay? That's what a slot machine is. You keep pulling, you keep every response as a pull, okay? And you can never predict when you'll receive reinforcement from slot machine. And that is what a variable ratio is, okay? The client is responding, 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 and they can't predict when reinforcement is coming, okay? Because it's on an average, okay? So this is just a pretty uh, standard bit of knowledge um, that you could see on this test. If you go on to get your BCBA, right, you'll almost definitely see this, okay? It's just what we know as the slot machine effect and it's why variable ratio is the strongest basic reinforcement schedule there is. Okay, during an assessment, the client's dad tells the BCBA that the client is aggressive towards his brother at random times throughout the day. Your BCBA asks you to observe how many instances of aggression during the assessment. What type of measurement are you going to use? Okay, so there's really only a few choices that should be in your head. Okay, it's a dead giveaway when you see how many instances, okay? It's a dead giveaway on what type of data you're looking for. If you see how many instances, if you see a count, okay? You know, you counted how many times it occurred. Immediately, you should start thinking frequency. You should think rate and you should think event recording, okay? It should be a dead giveaway. As you get better at this, okay? As you do more questions and study harder, there's gonna be some dead giveaways in these questions, okay? And once you start seeing the dead giveaways, it's like seeing the matrix, okay? These are gonna get really, really easy. This is a very easy question, okay? So you're observing how many instances happened. What are you using? Are you using ABC narrative recording? Well, no, because you're not looking at antecedents and consequences. You're just counting how many times it happened. Are you using event recording? Yes, event recording is just another name for frequency. Okay, and that's what you're doing. You're counting the number of times aggression occurred. Easy as that. Are you using discontinuous measurement? No, because you are recording every instance of behavior. Discontinuous measurement only records some instances of behavior. Time sampling, of course, is using time, which we're not doing. And time sampling is discontinuous, okay? We're using a continuous measurement. We are using event recording which is also known as frequency, okay? So difficult question if you, if you haven't been studying, okay? But once you do study, this question becomes extremely easy. And that's the great thing about the RBT exam is it becomes easy, okay? Once you get good at it, the test becomes very easy, okay? You just have to work at it. Okay, two more. What is one primary advantage of using a <clears throat> differential reinforcement of alternative behaviors intervention over a differential reinforcement of other behaviors intervention. Okay, so you're using a DRA over a DRO. What is the primary advantage of using that DRA over the DRO? Does DRO require punishment and punishment should be the last resort? Well, punishment should be your last resort, but DRO definitely does not require punishment. What is DRO? Differential reinforcement, okay? so. A is definitely out. What about DRA is always more effective than DRO? Again, always is very strong, right? We use a variety of interventions in ABA and depending on the client, they have different impacts and different outcomes. We should never say one is always more effective than the other, okay? It just depends on the client. What about DRA teaches a replacement behavior? Absolutely. And that is the great thing about DRA is we're actually teaching a functionally equivalent replacement 
Whereas DRO, we're not teaching a replacement behavior, okay? We are just reinforcing for that for a behavior not occurring. Both are effective, both are used. However, the great thing about DRA is we're teaching an actual replacement behavior, whereas DRO, we are not. And then finally, DRO is harder to implement. No, in a lot of cases, DRO would be actually easier, right? Because DRO, all you're doing is reinforcing when a behavior is not occurring. So pretty simple. If you're a DRO on screaming, whenever they're not screaming, you reinforce. So DRO can be very simple to implement. DRA is, is one advantage is because it teaches that replacement behavior. Finally, when Bill woke up this morning, he put on his slippers and walked downstairs to make coffee. He put the filter in the coffee maker and put coffee in the filter. When he went to start the coffee, it didn't turn on. Bill started pushing the on button harder and cursing before eventually giving up. Bill is experiencing what? Okay, so another real life situation. You might do the same thing. You might get ready in the morning, go to make coffee, right? And you know how frustrating it is when you put filter in the coffee maker and when you try to start the coffee, it doesn't turn on. So what does Bill do? He starts pushing the button harder, right? Maybe he starts pushing it faster and more um, than before. And then he starts cursing and then he gives up. What does this sound like to you? Okay. So think about the scenario. Bill's morning routine is very standard. Put the filter in the coffee maker, put coffee in the filter, turn coffee maker on, receive coffee. The reinforcement is the coffee. This morning, Bill's not getting coffee. So what happened? That reinforcement was removed. And when you receive reinforcement, and in turn, the behavior increases in intensity or increases in frequency, what is that? Sounds like an extinction burst, right? And that's what's happening to Bill. Typically, the, the Bill's behavior of turning the coffee maker on produces reinforcement, right? This morning, it did not. It didn't turn on, okay? So Bill goes through this extinction burst, okay, and eventually gives up. Textbook extinction burst, okay? Great way to remember extinction burst as well. Think about all the extinction bursts you have in your life, okay? If you go to turn on your laptop and it's dead, right? If you go to start your car and it doesn't turn on, okay? Start applying these concepts to your everyday life, okay? And you're going to get so, so much better at the exam. Spontaneous recovery, right, is when a behavior that was previously extinguished comes back. It's not what's happening here, okay? There's no reinforcement going on. Reinforcement was removed. And of course, we're not teaching some task, Jane, okay? Tip of the day, start applying concepts to your everyday life, okay? You're going to get better at the, the exam if you do that. Okay, thanks for watching. As always, any questions, comments, please leave them below. Please like and subscribe. Check out our study materials, rbtexamreview.com. Uh, keep studying hard, keep working hard, and I will see you soon.